Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Trek Yards. We have a very special guest, guests with us today, actually, and I'd like them to all introduce themselves. Hey, everybody, I'm Mike McMahon. I am the creator of Star Trek Lower Decks. Hey, everybody, I'm Barry, uh, Barry J. Kelly. I'm the supervising director of season two and season three of Star Trek Lower Decks. I am okay. Nolan Obana. I'm the art director for Lower Decks season two and season three. And uh, I'm Brad Winters. I'm a producer on Lower Decks. Um, we have uh, Mr. Nolan Obina with us, and we actually have a new ship called Obana. The Oban I've been saying it wrong. The Obana class, the Archimedes from the last episode. A lot of people have really liked that ship, and I kind of want to learn a little about it and uh, the process of designing that. And it's worth saying, as of recording this episode, our, our first looks at already about 30,000 views, so there's a lot of interest in this. And, you know, is it, uh, is it any Excelsior hull left over? Is it a full, fresh build? You know, yeah, please talk about it. Uh... Nolan, 29,000 of those views are me and Brad, so don't get too excited. <laughs> okay, 1,000 people have seen the episode. Still, still good, still good. I think originally it, it was supposed to be like in the Excelsior Legacy class, and it, it's separate, like from the beginning. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be an Excelsior, only Excelsior ex inspired. You know, modernizing it to our timeline. And we've tried a bunch of different um, nacelles on it. Like a, I think my first sketch had a D nacelle on it. Um, and then we decided to do a, a modified E, a little shorter, not as sleek. It's a little bit more boxier. It had only two sketches. One is like an Excelsior slash D. One is an Excelsior slash E. And Barry loves the E. So it's like, you know, <laughs> We'll put gold, like it'll, it'll be gold. It'll be, you know, uh, the deflector dish will be gold. And when we came down to tighten it up, um, we had our, our CG modeler, Marcelo, kind of work in the, the, the details. Um, and there were a couple of things like from the B and then the Excelsior that, that we got rid of. Um, it's less sleek, it's a little clunkier, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty chunky, um, but it still has, you know, like where engineering is, it's pretty similar, although it has a few differences. We stretched out the, the dish a little bit. When you first look at it from an, uh, a certain angle, it might look like the Excelsior until you start looking at it from the top down and it looks completely different. Uh, it has a completely different shape than the cells aren't as long. It's also much larger, right? Yeah. Because we needed, Larger. For the plot, we needed a really big ship that the Cerritos was was dwarfed by to save in this plot because that was like an inversion of season one. And the Excelsior almost isn't big enough for what we needed. So I kept pushing for like big, big, big. I want Sonia Gomez to have a giant ship. It's definitely an optical illusion sort of ship. You look at it from a second. It's always oh, the Enterprise B Excelsior, but literally every single shape is different might have similar tones, but everything's been shifted remarkably, actually, so it's it's really not the same. Okay, so you say bigger. We notice obviously there's three decks in the saucer rather than the two. Are we talking longer than the E? Is it, like, properly bulky, or is it kind of still just a, a, a high-tier ship or big for the fleet? I think, Brad, like, is think? it bigger than the E? I don't know. I was thinking it's bigger than I, the three, slightly longer than the three decks, it's, but I don't know. So, it's yeah, Nolan and Barry would be the best to remember this, but kind of uh, in the same way that for season one, it was, hey, when we're sizing the Cerritos, the Enterprise D is kind of our North Star. We're like everything referencing back to that. With uh, the Archimedes, it was the Cerritos is our, our baseline. So we had done a scaling... Right, Nolan, of like, here's yeah. the Cerritos to, it was kind of like, Mike, if the Archimedes was this long, and, and I, so it's definitely longer than the Cerritos, my guess is if we pulled it up, it would probably be a little shorter, but longer. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, it felt like a long ship to me. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Do you guys remember the design cue that I was pushing for for a long time and Brad talked me out of because he said, this is not a Starfleet thing to do? It was a paint on, oh my paint God. on the hull. <laughs> I wanted it to feel like no, there was just a big logo for uh, for uh, 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 for my favorite uh, Starship podcast on the front of it. No, the um, <laughs> uh, because the ship was a, I wanted it to feel like, hey, welcome to the Federation. We're a peaceful, friendly group, but also like this is our pizzazz ship. This is our first contact, kind of like you know, 
like really your first introduction to the kind of like Starfleet ideal, I wanted to put a big freaking Delta on the hull, like just a massive one on top of the, on top of the saucer section so that when you saw this, it was clear that this was not a military ship that it had like a bit of like an aesthetic design to it on the hull, that it was like a, that it was like a, oh, we're a species that also has art and that we can have flair and stuff. And that I think it just kept coming off as like fascist when you did it that big or like military or like a little, just not Starfleet. You know, if you have a giant, I'm talking like, think of it, it came off. Oh, another way of putting it is when you, when you put a logo that big on the saucer section, I'm talking like more than half the size of a, like a giant Delta. It ended up looking more like a mirror universe kind of like, nefarious kind of ship, which I think makes sense because we've seen that aesthetic in that before. But anyway, yeah. Brad, everybody talked me out of it and they were right to do so. And I would like but, a medal for listening to my but, team. Uh, <laughs> in fairness, in absolute fairness though, in design, you d sometimes you aren't gonna know if it works until yeah. you see it. So mm -hmm. it was fair to ask for it. That was one of the next questions is about that Delta on the bottom. And we still have a question about it now that we kind of know the impetus for it. But it is a TNG era logo, not the current logo that Starfleet is using. What's what's the what? Why does that, that date the ship at the very least as being sort of in between those eras? You know, those the logos of those. It there's a thing in lower decks that we do at least. And Brad, tell me tell me if this is not what our running line is on this because this is what I think is like it sort of fits in with the uniform and the com badge and like that in this era that there is a bit of captain's choice happening and that there is like a, not only captain's choice, but it's almost like, like when you see the different California class ships, like, yeah, the Cerritos is, has yellow cause it's an engineering ship primarily. And you'll see other ships in the California class that have red on the hull and they have blue on the hull, but there's also within that kind of set of parameters, you'll see that some of them have painted their hulls in different ways even though they have the color scheme, it's switching it up a little bit. And when you go into the ships, you'll see that the L cars have different kind of looks, that the paint jobs mm -hmm. are different on the inside. Partially, I think that that is Starfleet trying to have different minor divisions be separated by color schemes and paint jobs in different ways. But I do think that there is sort of like, you know, Starfleet isn't the military. There is sort of a, a personal kind of like attachment that everybody has and to me, we haven't explicitly said it in the show, but I kind of want the vibe to be like, maybe the people who take pride in these ships, like they get to have a say a little bit in how it's gonna be represented on the hull, which I know totally breaks the kind of uniform standard of Starfleet in the past, but like, this is 2380, like, you know, things are a little bit different. There's been a lot of years and, and it still basically feels like Starfleet. I kind of feel like that Delta falls in there or we just messed it up. Yeah. If there's one consistency, it's, it seems to be, at least in the 2360s to 2380s, it seems to be Starfleet is okay with fleet-wide inconsistencies in uniforms, insignia. Like, I just think about what admirals were wearing every couple episodes yeah, yeah, yeah. in yeah. the first couple seasons. So, and, and then you get into the, like, what we're seeing sometimes with season one uniforms in season three to it we know the real world production reasons for those but it to me is a like mike said it's an organization that's constantly like hey let's try these over here let's do this over here that you can always kind of find a canon explanation for why there are these differences but in fairness this is the a, a entire new branch of starfleet that you make a joke about that you know heard of a california class because they stay under the radar so if they're sort of doing that own separate division stuff do their own thing a little bit more anyway I think we're coming to our end of our time here. So uh, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us. We really, really super appreciate it. And we're hoping to talk to you all again soon. But, but seriously, you, 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 know, you obviously Mike, show running creator, but the artists that are here, seriously, you guys have done some phenomenal work. And obviously if you've seen our content, we, we look at it in depth, but the fact you know, we hear from our fans, it's just a cartoon, it's just animated. And we say, but it isn't though. They put that hard work in. So we feel able to say, but look at those buttons aren't the right place. And I'm saying, but those, all those buttons are. That 94% is right. So seriously, again, amazing work. Sorry it's so draining, but please don't stop that level of hard work.
<laughs> I, and, I, and I have to give a public fans. shout out to them, an underline on all of this that I think it's lost sometimes, all from home, all on residential dial up, all during a global pandemic, like the show, like all of season two was made from home. And I don't think it feels like that. I think you look at season one and season two, and I see people talking about season two must have had a huger budget and all this other stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> It didn't, and it was actually made with a huge handicap of the pandemic we all lived through. But all these artists, our team in Canada, Barry, Nolan, done like such an incredible job at all. <laughs> and thank you guys for being such fans. And then- Keep spreading uh, the word. Just keep spreading yeah, the word. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for being great ambassadors. We really appreciate it.